Hey friends, it's Sarah Rittendale. When I decided to act against all the toxic thoughts and feelings I was living with daily and try to become my best self, I quickly fell into the very common trap of perfectionism. So I decided to create a space where wellness doesn't mean being flawless. Becoming the best version of yourself doesn't just come from conversations about managing your mean mind, learning confidence, and always doing the things that you're supposed to do. Here, we talk about how normal your toxic feelings and thoughts are, that you're not doing something wrong because you don't always feel, think, or act how you envision your best self to, how to implement self-improvement strategies in a realistic way, and we do this through a variety of topics that often prompt our best selves to crave emergence. My mission? Inspire you to recognize that you don't have to be perfect to consider yourself whole, healthy, and well. This is the Well-ish Podcast. Hi guys, welcome back to Wellish. I know you missed me. This is Sarah Rittendale, your host. And if you weren't aware, I've been MIA for the last four, count them, four months. <laughs> I haven't posted an episode since July and I felt like there was really no better way to kick off season three after my complete and utter disappearance <laughs> than talking about burnout and talking about stress and talking about how you're not a failure if you take breaks because obviously that's what I was experiencing. You know, I had a lot going on. I was allowing social media to really overwhelm me and once I took like a two-week break and I wasn't posting on social media I found that I was a lot less anxious and I was doing things for myself that I wasn't doing when I was stressing myself out so bad so I took a few months to myself to find that spark again and regain some creativity from being so burnt out and so overwhelmed and doing so much that wasn't working for me. And it allowed my mind to really open itself up and come up with better ideas to execute the podcast in a way that hopefully you guys will be more receptive of. So there's going to be a few changes here for season three. We're going to be doing a lot of interviews. Um, we'll have some solo episodes, of course, but it's going to be mostly interview based. And we're, we'll see how it goes. You know, your girl can never stick to one thing for very long. So this is what we're going to be doing as we're heading into year three of the podcast. It was just two years of Wellish back in September. So we're on a good track. So today's episode is a conversation about a universal topic we all face, stress, hi, <laughs> but not just any stress. We're talking about the kind that hits hard in high pressure environments, the kind that's been known to lead to burnout and sometimes honestly even serious health issues. I've been lucky enough, I think, question mark, that I haven't experienced that so much. However, if you know, I really dive deep. It's very possible that I did and I just was ignoring it because the really weird thing about mind stuff is that you don't think anything is wrong with you where you do when it's physical. I feel like I could explain that better. If you break your leg, you know your fucking leg is broken. You know that you have to wear a cast. You have to go to the doctor. You have to have it repaired. You're walking around with crutches. Everyone can see it. It's external. Where when something happens mentally, you convince yourself that nothing's wrong and you just got to push through and power on and everything's going to be okay and everybody on the outside of you expects you to just be fine and happy and dandy and you ignore these issues that we're having. So for today's episode, I sat down with Kira Lescu, who is a meditation master who helps her clients prevent stress from starting no matter what is happening, which I think is so interesting because stress varies so much, whether it's something that you're experiencing in your personal life, in your mind, in your relationship with yourself, in your relationship with your partner, in your relationship with your parents, your kids, with your job, your coworkers. Whatever high stress situation you're in, she provides good insight 
on how to reduce that stress on a biological level, talking about things like how to actually bring your body back down to calm before you can start to reduce stress. Kira has a really inspiring story. She's not only survived these intense pressures, but has found a way to turn the tables on stress, creating calm and clarity in some of life's most overwhelming moments. She was in a really demanding industry where burnout was common, but by learning to manage stress from the inside out, she not only saved her own health, but became a source of strength and wisdom for her colleagues, peers, and later on clients. So today we're going to learn about her journey, her mindset shifts, and specific techniques she's developed to keep stress from even starting. And if you're someone who feels the weight of daily stress, this conversation could provide you with some real actionable takeaways for transforming pressure into peace. So grab a cup of coffee, find a quiet space, and let's dive into this incredible discussion on turning adversity into calm and clarity. Let's get started. Kira, thank you so much for being on Wellish. I'm so excited to have you with me today. It is my absolute pleasure to be here today. Yay, same here. So I really wanted to talk to you because I feel like myself and my listeners really fall into the trap of having to work hard in order to achieve everything that you want. And that mentality of, you know, end all be all. It's like it's whether it's something big, like starting a business or it's something small, like stopping yourself from people pleasing. Everything has this underlying message of perfectionism and you're not good enough until you do it the right way. It's the leads to these feelings of inadequacy, failure if you take breaks, and inevitably it leads to burnout. So when you said that you are able to fix that stress or to not feel stress from the start, no matter the circumstance that you're in, it really resonated with me. So I would love to start by you telling me a little bit about your background, telling me, you know, what, um, what led you realize that managing stress is really important for you and for your health and your success. Well, I've been a a serial entrepreneur for the majority of my life. And I was put in very difficult situations as a, at a young age, I was also an elite athlete at a very young age. So, um, but that, that can be quite stressful. And not only do you have the, um, the mental and emotional stress, but you have like the physical workload stress. So I did not handle it well when I was younger. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not by any stretch of the imagination. Does anybody? <laughs> and certainly had like some of those perfectionist tendencies as as well as much as my body could handle it. But when I came to the point where my, my business, I turned it around. I took over a business that was extremely challenged, very close to bankruptcy, and um, turned it around. And it was growing massively, which it had to do in order to succeed. But I was, I got into that trap of kind of thinking like I had to be there all the time. And once you get to a certain level with your nervous system, um, it's a physiological response we have. It affects us mentally and it affects us emotionally, but our nervous system gets very inefficient. So we lose a ton of mental and emotional abilities. So it, we can't do, we literally can't do things as fast. So you can kind of think of it, if you think of it like an athlete, it's like you can't run at the same pace for even 400 meters that you can for a hundred meters. So that's what a lot of people are trying to do is they're trying to sprint all day long and our physical body can't do it. So it's about optimizing and training your nervous system, which really takes very little time to do compared to the huge benefits you get as an outcome to be, first of all, be resilient um, and to recover from the, the physiological responses, the physical chemicals that your body's putting that cause that. And then as you become better and better at that, you actually become resilient to stress if you continue the practices. So you can put in more time, but not be in that stress mode. So the time that you're putting in is highly efficient. And it's usually way more effective as well, because you're bringing way more of your mental and emotional abilities to whatever it is you're doing. You're bringing at the high end of what your potential is rather than, um, you know, a lower gas tank, a a partially emptied or maybe almost totally emptied gas tank to that. 
Sure. Absolutely. I think it's interesting because when I, um, was obviously first starting to do that, it would always be this mentality of like, go, 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 go. You can never take breaks. And then I realized that I got farther if I gave less, but allowed myself the rest because I never had that inevitable burnout point where I just was like, screw it. I quit yeah. completely. I can't do it anymore. So that for sure makes sense. I'm curious with you saying that you did work in this high stress environment. And then you talked about the people that you worked with also noticing that with like their own stress levels and your lower stress level. What was that like? And how did you start to manage this in such a high stakes environment? So first of all, there's physiological practices that you do. And I use a combination of five to get the that kind of result where you can do it in literally like seven to 12 minutes per day. And, um, you know, and over time, you will encounter, you, I'm, I'm in a situation, oh, this would have so stressed me out before. And then you're just looking at it and going, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's the best feeling. <laughs> you know, I had this this meeting just last week with somebody. They're like trying to fix like, you know, mental health in a certain area. And they're like in this huge negative zone. They and I and then as soon as he's talking to him, like do XYZ, like I literally gave him two and a half points. And he's like, I never saw that. That's what your brain does when it's stressed and overwhelmed. It doesn't have the same abilities that it has when you're in a calm state. So that's job one. So if you're not putting yourself in the right state first, I mean, it's not 100% of the time possible. Like sometimes we just have to deal with something because it comes up. But the more you have the ability to do that and you're preventative in that, then you can go through things that might otherwise be challenging and they're not. You see the solutions and it's not stressful either, even though other people might perceive it. So kind of going back to the story that I told you, I was going through some really hard business stuff and um, like life stuff as well, relationship things. And, and I was like, oh, and then this happened and this happened. And then, you know, one of my colleagues stopped me and said, I'd be in the hospital if I was doing what if I was going through this, they're like, you're standing here smiling and you're just talking. Like, it's like, you're saying, yeah, I went and got a coffee. <laughs> um, but to me, it, that's it, it, Although they weren't things I would prefer to not have had to do, sure. um, they were necessary. And, but I didn't have the stress going through it because I was, I was already a master by that time at, you know, practicing these techniques. So my body and mind and emotions didn't go there very easily, as long as I continued to practice. Sure. So going back to your mentality, when you were still in that high stress state, what was the turning point for you that made you go, okay, I got to make a change, I got to do something about this? What did that look like? Well, there, there are a couple. So one of them was, um, you know, I almost got in a car accident. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I was so tired. Like, I almost oh. was like, driving. So, because wow. um, I was working very crazy hours, like, like different schedule, all that, like 24 hour schedule, kind of like it was changing all the time. And my body was like, just, just confused plus long hours. Right. So I had the combination of those. And then I also, I was getting, you know, feedback from some of my biggest clients that they're like, you're not all there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. They, they can recognize that, you know, like I wasn't focused in conversations, sure. which has been very well known for and that you know I was losing focus I was forgetting things which I mean those are signs that burnout starting um you know overwhelm is going into burnout so um so those two things happen relatively close to one another yeah Okay. That is very relatable, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes yeah. sense. Absolutely. So you've, like we talked about at the beginning, you've developed these techniques to prevent stress from even starting regardless of the circumstances. So can you walk us through some of those techniques or mindset shifts? Yeah. So, I mean, mindset's important, but they're more actual physical practices. So I have a background. I mean, I'm a meditation master at multiple styles. These practices are all um, what were traditionally considered pre-meditation. Um, so they, you don't have to meditate to be able to do them. Although if you do want to meditate, this makes it way easier. So it's a combination of five different practices. So some of the, the majority of it um, come from a yogic science. 
Um, and then it's done in a combination that first of all, you learn how to calm your nervous system down very quickly and then to release the stress hormones. But this is not like asana going to asana class. <laughs> you know, I'm also, I'm also a teacher at that. This is very different. The, that kind of works if you've got mild temporary stress. These practices will work even if you're in like burnout or close to, you know, extreme burnout. Although if someone's really yeah. extreme burnout, they may need medical attention as well that this will help but it won't be enough on its own but if you catch that burnout in early stages absolutely this will turn it around to healthy so it's the combination of um, doing them together with a teacher that's trained <laughs> and mm -hmm. their progressive practices as well. So will you feel relief on the first day? Absolutely. Um, but then over time it's like you know it's becoming good at it really. Um, sure. And learning how to use them. Oh, first of all, recognizing that, oh, wait, I'm going down a path that's not helping me here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then having the practices and techniques to get you turned around to healthy. I think it's interesting because a lot of what you're saying sounds like being proactive instead of reactive. Is that correct? Well, it is. But even if you're already there, it actually turns the turns it around. Like I had uh, an example, one person came in, very successful entrepreneur, um, didn't realize that they were overwhelmed because unfortunately the majority of people today, if you're under the age of 50, your chances are over 70% that you've been some degree of stress since the year were born. If you're like wow. under 30, that's in the nineties, like over 90% of people have been some degree of stress since they were born. So their bodies actually don't know anything different. They think that's normal. So I used to call healthy, normal. But then I realized normal is actually stress, overwhelmed and burnt out. So I don't <laughs> use that language anymore because that is actually what the majority yeah. of people experience. So I brought her, you know, she came to her first session with me and then I did a, um, you know, practice that was a pretty strong one. I wouldn't normally do with someone on the first day, but she was like almost in a panic attack. And then I said, okay, now tell me what's wrong. And then she's like, I can't even remember. Oh, that's great. <laughs> She's like, I know, I, I know what the issue is, but it's not as bad as I thought. And yeah. I actually there, I, I thought there's no way out of this. And actually, I don't know what the answer is now, but I know it's going to be okay. Wow. So that, that's, that's what's important. It, it, so even if you're in a really bad initial state, it interrupts and turns around to healthy your nervous system. Okay. And your brain, your brain as well in a physiological sure. way. Yeah. So how can somebody that has been following that track of stress and burnout and those reactions, especially like you're saying, if it's something that we've basically been doing since birth, how can they start to reframe and redirect and relearn? How to be better. Well, I mean, the first thing you need to decide, and this is, I think, the hardest, it's, it goes one of two ways. Either people are like, I can get out of this, sign me up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or the other thing is people don't believe it's possible because they look around them and they see people. And to be fair, there are some people that are very successful that are like flirting with that burnout continuously. But I mean, I've trained so a lot of people over the years that once they turn this around to healthy, they just have a whole other gear that they didn't even know that they had. So the first mm -hmm. thing is like deciding that you're going to do something about it and deciding that you that this is actually not helping your success whatsoever. You yeah. may still be successful, but it's not helping you do things better or getting to where you want to go. Plus, why have an uncomfortable journey when you can make it so much more comfortable? Not to say right. you won't have challenges, but I mean, you can go through that. Like I did, like people are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh yes. And then I, ha I have this thing. So now I have to do this and I have this thing. So now I have to do this rather than like, uh, yeah. And the whole time you're like, ah, oh, I can't handle it inside. Yeah. That part's optional. You do not have to do that part, but it does take practice. So it's, it, it doesn't take a lot of practice and it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, but it does take consistency. Of practice and deciding that's the first thing deciding that this is going to be uh, an easier path and that you are going to take you know do what it takes to to learn and practice every day <laughs> or so. absolutely i 
I think that was like one of the biggest things for me, because it sounds like a lot of it is really just gaining this level of control over your stress response. And I think when I first started to do that, I expected to read a couple self-help books or implement a couple practices that maybe I saw on TikTok or Instagram and expect these like perfection results when the practice is really the biggest thing. You're always potentially going to feel some level of stress or even if you master it where like to the point that you're at, it's like you still, like you mentioned at the beginning, feel that like, oh, I would have had a different response to this in the past, but you feel those triggers coming up and it's how you executed each time, practicing how you executed each time. And it might not be exactly as you pictured in your head, but eventually you're going to get better and better at it over time. So that's really good insight. I think I'm curious what, when people started talking to you about your calm mentality, what were some of those? So you mentioned take, um, identifying that you want to make that change. What were some other beginning steps that you would give people that asked you advice on? I mean, actually people are like, they actually started like, can you train me? Really? <laughs> well, well, that's so what cool. you're doing, can you train me? I'm like, I had really very little intention of, of teaching this at all. And then like people just kept coming to me. <laughs> that's so <laughs> I cool. I try to do something else entirely. And uh, people just kind of kept coming to me and saying, um, you know, um, whatever the, this is that you're doing, I need, I need to learn this. And then the other things weren't working out. And then one day I was speaking with one of my entrepreneur friends and he's like, well, people want this. Why don't you do this? <laughs> Give it to them. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So like when you, when somebody says to you, Kira, I'm so stressed, I can't handle it you say, okay, identify it. And then what would be the next step? Well, I mean, we take people, like, it's kind of like a train, like a training program that we take people through. So there are okay. like, it's, it's kind of like, if you want to get in shape, you, you kind of mm. you know, need, need a progressive program. So I have a background of an athlete. So I always, you know, was able to take the practices that I learned. Now, when I learned to do this, it took a couple hours a day to be as resilient as I am, but I'm like, no, 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 no. I can do this better. So I kind of use myself as my own laboratory and I distilled it down to, okay, this, this thing does this thing, this thing does this thing. And I'm like, uh, because I, like, I knew my entrepreneur friends, like I was in so much burnout and I had such a big business problem for me. It was worth two hours a day to be in the right state to not lose it all. Right. Yeah, but, totally. Uh, I don't want to spend that much time. And I, and then when other people started asking me, I was able to distill that down so that you, it could be done in minutes per day, but it still takes daily practice because mm -hmm. your body, um, it has a circadian cycle. And if it's not used to being in a healthy state, it does need to be reset on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're identifying what is triggering that stress for you and then figuring out what reduces We're that. We're actually that teaching your body how, first of all, what is a calm state, like a healthy state, a calm state, and, and even like beyond healthy, like going into what I call higher performance. It's like above healthy. Um, so you, first of all, you're, um, doing practices that are getting rid of all the stress hormones that you already have. So it's helping your body to process that and eliminate that. And then it's calming your nervous system down. So it's not by default going into creating those stress hormones anymore because those stress hormones, they have more, I was just doing a list this week, more than 20 different mental and emotional effects. Wow, And they diminish your, literally your, like, if you have a gas tank, it's like, you know, limiting your gas tank. Some, some of the abilities go down by at least 90%. So when you're retraining your mind in your nervous system, not to go into that, you're releasing the stress hormones from your body. Now your body's way more he healthy, but you're getting all these mental and emotional abilities back. When you have stress hormones, it's way easier to um, your body to say, oh, more stress hormones, because it's already in that mode that something hard is happening. So I need stress hormones because I need to survive this. It's really putting you into survival mode. So when we teach people um, the practices that start to eliminate this, 
they, first of all, if it's coming on, they know what to do about it. But second of all, it's not, you don't have, it's like getting rid of all the old garbage in your body. So you're sure. starting from a healthier state. And then on top of that, it's starting to promote the positive hormones that you have in your body when you're in, in a healthy state or beyond that. So, um, so it's kind of like, you know, increasing the positive and decreasing the negative at the same time. Interesting. Just to share a shift that I feel I'm already experiencing from just this little bit of talking to you. When you first started talking, I started thinking of, you know, how, what about, you know, you, we've got this, um, all these responsibilities and all this stuff. And a lot of it, I feel like once you're into adulthood that you don't really learn until you are in adulthood and not don't have the structure of school and childhood is how much freedom you have. So I feel like a lot of the stress can almost feel self and post and you feel like I'm choosing to participate in all of this stuff. And so I was kind of um, battling in my head when you started talking about, okay, sure. So I could eliminate some of the things that don't need to stress me out, but what do I do about the things that I do have to get done? Like for example, the podcast, I've got to get that edited and, and recorded and got to post it at the certain time. So like, how do you manage all that? But even just through you talking about it and being able to prioritize and time manage, it sounds like it's, a lot more doable than maybe I even thought 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. So I think that's really impressive. You brought up an amazing point here. So somebody that's overwhelmed, five hours of work will take 10 hours. And this is for a few reasons. First of all, you're losing mental abilities. But one of the big things that people lose is focus. And focus encompasses a number of different things. Like if we actually just sit down and are able to focus and get things done, first of all, um, you know, that eliminates some of the overwhelm there. But if your mind's always running to, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, you're losing where you're at. So then you have to refocus on where you're at. So something that maybe should take 20 minutes now takes 40 minutes. And that's happening to you all day. And some people are, are way worse than that. I've trained people that like, they tell me I work 13 hours a day. And then after, you know, uh, like a 10 to 12 week program with me, they're like, my job takes three hours. Oh my God, no way. It's their nervous system. But now they're also starting to see clearly that, wait a second, all these things I'm doing aren't actually giving me a good result or right. there's a better way to do it. So when your mind is overwhelmed, it can't see the best way to do it because your nervous system is designed so that if it has a uh, perceived danger to your survival and stress is perceived danger to your survival, it cuts out everything that isn't necessary to keep you physically alive. And usually that means run away or hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so cool. that, 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 that's what we do they're like eh, I don't want to do this um, yeah. and it's because we're overwhelmed so that's part of that you know that stress response that is our, connected to our survival response um, but also we lose all these mental abilities so when you learn to calm those down all of a sudden like you know I have people like say you know 13 hours of work takes three hours yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really sounds like you've been able to manage opening up that capacity to problem solve in ways maybe that you weren't able to before or people that you're coaching training can't do. Can you speak to that any further? Do you have like a specific example of anything? Uh, geez, I, I've got thousands of examples. <laughs> of <laughs> um, I had I had one pretty successful entrepreneur. He sold once. He probably could have retired, but he was pretty young and wanted to keep working. But the next business was a lot harder than the first one. And he he said that he's like, uh, some days I don't even know why I took this on. Um, and then, but it was, it was making headway. It was, it wasn't anywhere near where it had, you know, the previous one had been. But he kept, he kept saying, oh, man, I just wish my team would leave me alone. They keep bugging me about this idea. I just don't want to hear about it anymore. And mm -hmm. interestingly, he wasn't really stressed by the business, but he just had so many things in his life that he was responsible for, you know, like family things and, um, you know, other things that he committed to. 
um, that that were going on. And I mean, the business was minimally stressful, but overall, when you looked at the whole picture, he was actually closer to overwhelm. Then all of a sudden we're doing a practice and he opens his eyes and he's like, the theme, the thing my team has been bugging me about is a bigger business than what I'm trying to do now. And it's probably going to take us half the time mm-hmm. in the middle of a that, practice. That's insane. <laughs> I'm like, good, good idea. Um, keep finishing. <laughs> Yeah, literally. Well, and like, that's what happens, right? It's like, you're thinking of all these different things. Oh, that's so interesting. But this is the thing that a lot that happens with a lot of people, the answers were there before. But when you're in a stressed or overwhelmed state, your mind in your your brain can't hear it. So true. Like, I, I've, seen, I've seen so many people like I was, you know, standing in a group of uh, entrepreneurs, actually that same group that were kind of stressed. And one person was giving the other person an answer to their problem. And he was like arguing why this can't work or why it won't work for him. That is a stressed or overwhelmed brain that interestingly, he started um, practice. Uh, I started training him. And then, you know, about, a, you know, three, four weeks later, he's like, oh, I had this amazing idea. And it was like that conversation had never happened. I'm like, yeah, I was there when someone else yeah. told you about it. <laughs> but the mind doesn't remember it. Mm-hmm. When he had this idea, it was like, like it was like to him, it had come out of the blue, but it is something he'd actually seen. But when he was in that overwhelmed state, his mind's filtering it out. Sure. So you can't hear it. It's interesting because you that- calm yourself down. And then, and then whether you see it from somewhere else or you remember it, now you're in a state where you can actually do something about it and it makes sense. And he's like, oh, this is the answer to the problem. This is so easy. I'm going to save like a week of time doing this every month. <laughs> yes. Well, that's it's that's literally what I was just about to say. Like, it's interesting because it reminds me of meditation because I, I do like to meditate. And if you yeah. calm your mind down, you can ask yourself pretty much anything. And almost instantly you come up with an answer to literally any question you ask yourself. But allowing yeah. yourself to come to the down to that calm state of mind. And if you don't, you don't hear anything. You've got all the ideas running through your head. Yeah. And, and I mean, I am a, a meditation master at several styles, but meditating, if you're beyond mild and temporary stress, is actually a really hard thing to do. And I it's you. easier to do the other practices to calm yourself down before you learn to meditate. So I kind of learned it the opposite way. Um, Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of practice to calm yourself down if you're beyond mild stress. Um, So when people started asking me to do this, I'm like, they're not going to have the the patience that I had. Like I was an elite athlete. I used to train five hours a day. Like that's kind of a meditation. So like for me to sit and do something for two hours, it was making me feel better. But somebody that doesn't have that background, chances are they're not going to do it, It, especially to put in that much effort to um, see a result because it takes a long time to calm yourself down that way. But if you do it the way I teach it, you can get that in minutes. And then if you want to learn to meditate, it's so much easier because you're starting from a calm state rather than, so it's like, you know, trying to learn to run on something flat rather than trying to learn to run with a backpack and mountain climb at the same time. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, cool. So kind of a little switching gears, I wanted to talk to you about the impact of stress on decision-making and creativity. You mentioned that stress impacts your ability to listen and connect with others. So how does that, how does it specifically impact it? Okay, so we covered three things there and stress negatively affects all of them. So uh, let's deal with creativity first. It's actually the one that takes the biggest hit um, when we're in stress mode. So even mild stress, about 70% of your creativity can go. If you're overwhelmed, it can actually be over a hundred percent, meaning that you'll make stuff up that you don't even have to do that are problems. Um, wow. <laughs> I've seen this a lot. I've seen this a lot. I've even seen it in myself before I, you know, really mm-hmm. learned how to turn this around. So, um, that that's one thing the emotional side is we lose uh, someone who's stressed to burn out will lose between 30 and 50 percent of their emotional intelligence and their emotional quotient so emotional intelligence is how you perceive yourself and others um, emotionally and how correct that is 
And then your emotional uh, uh, quotient is your ability to apply that in a useful and effective way that doesn't overstep boundaries of others. I add that because I'm a meditation master. So you can use emotional intelligence to be manipulative. That's not what we're training people to do. It's, <laughs> it's not to be a good human at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, so between the creativity and problem solving, it's like you you can't see things in innovative ways. And then you add to that your emotional intelligence. Obviously, that gives you so many advantages that you wouldn't have otherwise. That makes sense. So how did you see this impact the clients that you're working with? And what changes did they experience once you taught them how to manage that better? Oh, my goodness. Um well, I told you the one example about the person mm -hmm. came up with a, of a way easier business. I was working with um, actually an elite athlete teaching them these practices because they were having a very emotionally difficult time um, because of basically all the stress hormones, but add on top of that, the um, lactic acid from training. So they had a double whammy. So there's all this pressure. And they were consistently just kind of falling short a little bit of what they're doing. But one of the biggest things was mentally is that they couldn't get through the training schedule because of the amount of actual physical stress from the training, as well as the mental and emotional side. So after a week of training, like this person's coach thought this was hooey. <laughs> <laughs> there was like, you know, there's no science behind this. I'm like, there's actually a lot of science behind it. But then in the second week, he called me up and he's like, what have you done to my athlete? I'm like, I don't know, like what happened? And he goes, I am, I'm training a completely different person. I am seeing wow. things out of them physically, mentally, and emotionally that I've never seen before. Like they're making it through a whole week of really hard training. I'm throwing everything at them, things wow. that... I wouldn't like this was a female athlete. He's like, I don't have guys that can do what she's doing right now mm -hmm. um, in terms of like relative to the level of workload. And he's like, the emotional outbursts aren't there. She's not upset anymore. She's happy at the end of the week. She's sleeping better, like all of these things. Um, yeah. And, uh, wow. you know, and the stress wasn't there. And of course, a huge leap in performance for her, um, you know, went from, you know, a sort of, you know, state provincial level athlete to an international, you know, top 10 consistently in the world and occasionally top three in the world within a few months, like with under half a year. Wow. What do you think her biggest shift was? Like, can, do you know, can you share with us, like, what was the mentality it, it's, before? It's the stress hormones. It's the stress hormones. Really? So, and so it's not like, it's, it sounds like it's not so much like your own thoughts. It's more what your body's doing. Unless you're highly trained, someone who's a highly trained meditator, like if you're like beyond advanced, like ADEP expert level or higher, you can be in a stress state and get it turned around because you are so aware of what your mind is doing. But until you're at that level, the, the, easier way to go about it. And this, the way that most people can succeed is get rid of the stress hormones first. Okay. What's the best way to do that? I mean, the five practices that, that I've, that I've put together that, that okay. kind of work together. Yeah. Okay, cool. I love that. So, uh, I also want to talk about those practical tips for building resilience against burnout. So what are some quick practical tips you would recommend for somebody who's on that edge of burnout, feeling the overwhelm? First thing is you need to decide that it doesn't need to be that way. Um, and the other thing I see a lot of people do, like I've trained so many people that say, oh my gosh, I should have done this years ago. Like they think if I just get over the next thing, then it's going to get better, but then there's another next thing. So it never does. So it's really about deciding um, I'm not going to wait until I have a crisis to deal with it. Um, like, that's kind of how I came to this. I'm like, I had a crisis. I had to deal with this. Or I'm like, I might not actually live. <laughs> yeah. um, like, that, and that's how, like, how bad it had to get for me personally to, to do something about it. So the first thing is like making that decision that it doesn't have to be that way. And to really open your mind and believe that 
you can be healthy and that that's actually going to help you get what you want. It's probably going to make it way faster. It's certainly going to make it way easier. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Yeah. Are there any daily habits or practices that you think make the biggest difference in building resilience? I mean, I think for, for sure, calming your nervous system down, but uh, I'm, and once you've done that, then starting to pay attention to how things are affecting you, like every little thing. Um, so if you're in a, my, okay, one of my early meditation teachers explained it to you, me this way. If you have a pile of spaghetti and you put a drop of red food dye on it, it's hard to see the red food dye because it's kind of the same color. You might notice mm -hmm. it, but but you'll really have to look at it and it's just kind of blend in with all the, you know, the tomato sauce, right? But the more you put time into clearing yourself, the more you can see what that red food dye is. So if those are things that are negatively impacting you, you start to pay attention and you're like, you know, I... I quit eating certain foods because I noticed I just wasn't as mentally clear when I had them as when I ate other foods. And sometimes it would be really weird. Like, um, like I love, I love beans. <laughs> I feel really good when I eat them, but only certain kinds. So like I started to notice, okay, if I eat this kind of bean, then um, I'm not as mentally clear than if I eat this other one. So that's, you know, something that's pretty subtle, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's a marginal difference, but it is a difference. But that takes, you know, personal awareness and paying attention to those small things. But it can also be as simple as media. Like if you have a younger audience, I would say that's probably one of the biggest things that they can pay attention to is that if you're watching watching something, listening to something, do you feel better or worse after listening to it? Probably worse. My personally, normally worse. <laughs> yeah. Right. So why? Why? Right. Right. And um, then controlling that and noticing it, like you're saying. Noticing it, but then also like just to make again, it's about back to making that decision that I'm not going to do this anymore. Like, what am I going to pick right now? Am I going to pick continuing down this path that I know isn't making me feel good? Or am I going to make another choice? Right. Absolutely. Sweet. Okay. Well, I do have to wrap us up. I've got a couple questions okay. for us. I like to play a game called kind of toxic, kind of well. So okay. the point behind the game that I play with my guests is because a lot of the time you guys seem to have it all together and have all the answers. And it kind of highlights that we don't always, all of us don't always think 100% perfect, but because <laughs> you guys are so healed it, you guys normally give really good answers and how to kind of redirect mm -hmm. that. So I'll ask you the question. And then if you want to share, you know, what you do about it, then we can go from yeah. there. Okay. I absolutely. Sounds like fun. Okay, great. So the first one is when do you find yourself feeling anxious? Hmm. The only time I, I very rarely do now, I did a lot in the past. So I'm going to go back to when I did in the past. And normally it was when I felt like there were too many things going on. Or I felt like I didn't have in some way skills or knowledge um, or on some way I felt like I wasn't enough. I wasn't, I wasn't worthy enough. And I mean, that's a whole other discussion. I, I done so <laughs> much work on, on that. <laughs> um, but, you know, really taking the time out and, um, you know, spending the time healing myself was probably one of the most valuable things I did and getting obviously out of the stress and overwhelm, like getting the nervous system turned around is the first step because that can, sometimes that's a hundred percent of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a hundred percent. Um, and then sometimes it might be the first 75%, but at least you're coming at it from a strength. Absolutely. I love that. What causes you to doubt yourself? Hmm. Despite having like more than 25,000 hours of meditation practices, doubts do arise. Typically for me, it's like, am I doing like the right thing? Is this morally right? 
Um, is, am I telling the truth about, you know, what I'm saying here? And, you know, I do definitely question myself on that, but then, you know what, sometimes we just screw up and make mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure. there's sometimes I like, I still do it despite the meditation. I'm like, I did, I do that mm-hmm. <laughs> practice go into meditation because I have the expertise to do that and then see was there a better and sometimes it's actually the best way to handle it in the moment it might not be what I wanted to do and then I forgive myself and move on yeah absolutely when do you catch yourself feeling resentful very 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 rarely I I think as an athlete I was really trained from a young age that there's so much that's within your control and I kind of saw firsthand, like I was definitely not the by any stretch. I was probably the least amount of talent. In fact, I have, you know, testing <laughs> to prove that. They said I was the I had the least capacity as an athlete of any athlete that they'd ever Oh tested. my God. Um, but and and all my teammates were kicking my butt. Um, and they're like, I don't know how you're doing what you're doing. It's because I had mental skills that everybody else didn't have. So what I learned at a very young age is that everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. So even if I'm resentful because somebody else is stronger at something than me, I have something that maybe is easy for me that I don't even know is easy for me that other people don't have. So I think that made it way easier for me not to be resentful. Yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. When do you feel shameful? Hmm. I haven't in a long time. Um, Good. (laughs) Typically, if in the past, let me just tune in. I really feel like if I feel like I did something that was morally wrong or that, you know, I made a mistake that um, was preventable through my own um, lack in some, in some way that, that was genuine. Um, Other than that. And then of course it's like, okay, I'm going to forgive myself here. And if reparations are needed or, you know, something's required to, maybe it's an apology, maybe I actually have to do something to turn the situation around. Then after that, I, you know, I really let myself uh, off the hook. And sometimes that's not possible. So sometimes you just need to let yourself off the hook. (laughs) Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and and forgive yourself. Yeah. mm -hmm. If you could give one piece of advice to someone trying to become more well than toxic, what advice would you give them? I mean, just keep at it. Just keep at it. And, you know, really notice the things. And I would say turn off to the best of your ability. Like there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of truth telling that's going on today that is extremely important because it's going to help us progress as a society. It's going to help us progress as individuals. But there's a lot of stuff as well where that can turn into toxicity. So it's about having the discernment about what part of it. And it's not always black and white and it's not always 100%. So someone might be telling the truth, but doing it in a toxic way. So I think, it, first of all, it's about having the discernment about what that is. And then second of all, dealing with it within yourself, dealing with whatever practices you can do within yourself to eliminate it within yourself and then doing your best without being perfectionist to put more of that out in the world. And what do you focus on? Your mind is a filter. It will focus on what you train it to focus on. So train it to focus on wholesome things that are non-toxic. Yes, absolutely. Great advice. Well, where can people find you? Okay. The best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. I am the only Kira Lescu on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best way to find. (laughs) Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you, Kira, so much for all of your information and for being here. I really appreciate you. I am just so excited to be here today, Sarah. I hope this conversation really helps move some people forward so that they don't experience some of the things that we've, we've been talking about today, the stress, the overwhelm, or whether it's, you know, some other negative emotion and the perfectionism and all of that. So it's so exciting to be here. And it's so exciting that you're doing so much wonderful for your audience as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you guys found some insight or even a little piece from our conversation today. Remember, achieving calm and learning to manage stress is a journey and each step forward, no matter how small, is progress. You're not always going to feel 100% perfect. It's not going to be this moment of clarity, a threshold you cross that you feel like you're stress-free, living in la-la land, completely flawless. There's going to be times that you feel stress, but it's how you are proactive in preventing the stress to the best of your ability and reactive when you do recognize those triggers. That's what really counts. If you felt inspired or picked up some helpful tips, please make sure to subscribe and share the episode with anyone that you think could use a bit of in their life. You can follow Wellish on TikTok and on Instagram for all Wellish update and news regarding the show. Wellish on Instagram is at Wellish podcast and then the TikTok is just my name at Sarah Rittendale. Becoming the best version of yourself isn't about perfection, it's about progress. It's about recognizing that even with all those messy, difficult, and sometimes toxic feelings, you're still worthy of growth and wellness. Here, we're redefining what it means to be well and embracing that the journey to self-improvement includes every part of you, strengths, struggles, and everything in between. Let's continue finding ways to grow realistically and sustainably one step at a time. This is Wellish, where health and happiness don't demand perfection. Talk to you guys next time.